Come on in. Have a seat. Make sure you're comfortable and help yourself to some refreshments. Because I'm about to tell you the tale of the savior of the old republic. The tale of a man so daring, so brave, he didn't level up a single time. This is the tale of Noel Valing. No Ulvaling. No leveling. Alright, fuck you, I'm really proud of that one. Before we get started, I should probably answer the question you all came here for. Can you beat Coder 2 without leveling up? Yep. Oh, you're still here. Well, I guess I could elaborate a little. Spoilers for the following games. The final area of the game, regardless of your choices, is always the same. Trey is core at the heart of Malachor V. And we start the game on Paragus II, a dinky asteroid mining station on the edge of the galaxy. Now, a cursory Wikipedia search reveals that these two places are actually quite close to each other. Just a quick hop, skip, and a jump, and we're there. Except, that's not how this video game works. Coder 2 is a simple linear progression system, with a few branching paths to keep it interesting. Let's break it down by planets. Paragus 2, Telos, Nar Shadda, Dux and Onderon, Dantooine, Korriban, Dantooine again, Telos again, and finally Malachor 5. Now barring major glitches, we have to go to all of these places at least this many times. But let's just take it slow and steady and work our way backwards finding the bare minimum we need to accomplish to get to Treyas Core. Treyas Core is accessed from Treyas Academy. Before you can leave Treyas Academy, you must defeat Darth Sion. Before entering Treyas Academy, you have to activate all four mass shadow generators on Malachor V's surface. But first, you have to defeat the Greater Storm Beast after landing on the planet. Traveling to Malachor V requires planting four proton cores and defeating Darth Nihilus aboard the Ravager. And of course, the Ravager can only be accessed after reaching Telos while it is under attack by, you guessed it, the Ravager. To trigger the Ravager's siege on Telos requires you to best Atris and her handmaidens on the surface of the planet. Obviously, before this can happen, you need to confront the Jedi Masters on Dantooine. How could you possibly hope to confront these Jedi on Dantooine when they've each decided to conveniently hide themselves on four separate planets across the galaxy? This is the point in the game where the branching paths open up, so don't get too flustered, but you can search each of these four planets in any order. On Korriban, find Jedi Master Lona Vash. On Onderon, find Jedi Master Kavar. On Nar Shadda, find Jedi Master Zez Kael. And on Dantooine, find Jedi Master Brook. Of course, before you can search for the four Jedi Masters, you need to first learn where they're hiding, which you'll find on Telos. And finally, before you travel to Telos, you have to blow up the Progress 2 mining station where we start the game. And what you'll notice is none of that sounds that difficult. Well, fuck you, because it was really hard. The important question to ask is, how can you do all of this at level 1? Well, in Coder 2, there's really only one thing that can stop you. Enemies. Good thing we have a clear run to the ship. Threat. Master, perhaps I did not enunciate clearly the last time we spoke. I suggested that you should shut down, stay put, and wait for rescue. Let's look at all the ways enemies can stop us. 1. By killing us. If at any point, for any reason, every member of your party is dead, the game stops, fades to black, and forces you to reload from a save. And two, by not dying. Because some enemies need to be killed to progress to the next part of the game. And that's it. As long as we can kill everything in the game without the whole party dying, we've got this one in the bag. We'll come back to all of this later, but for now, let's get this run underway. This is one of the most important decisions in the run. I'll be making a male Jedi Guardian. Looking back, female would probably have been a better choice, because it skips a stupid fight that was not at all balanced for someone who can't level up. But we'll get there, don't worry. Jedi Guardian is the choice that matters. We chose the Jedi Guardian because, are you ready for this? They're the only Jedi class that has demolitions as a class skill. What does that mean? As a class skill, we can level demolitions all the way up to 4 instead of 2. That's it. That's the only reason we chose the Jedi Guardian, for two points in Demolitions. For Attributes, the most important stat will be Intelligence. 18 Intelligence gives us a modifier of plus 4, which means we will get to spend an additional 4 skill points each level, which would be fantastic if we were allowed to do that. As it is, we get an additional 16 skill points to spend while building our character. 
the plus four intelligence modifier also gives us a plus four bonus to all skills that are governed by intelligence, which includes demolitions. More on that later. As for the rest of the attributes, we need 12 constitution, and I'll dump the rest of our points into strength and dexterity. For skills, four demolitions is necessary. Two stealth, one stealth is needed to use stealth mode, but more is better. Since stealth is not a class skill, we can only put two points into it. The rest of our points will go into awareness, persuasion, and treat injury. I have no idea if these will ever come in handy, but if I don't spend these points now, I'll never get another chance. And finally for feats, I'll choose heavy armor proficiency. Not because I think I'll ever need it, but I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Cool, we're ready to start the game. We awake from a coma on Paragus 2. Our only goal is to get off this damn rock. But first, I have to explain how scaling works in this game. Enemies scale based off of your level. The enemy's health, stats, etc. are set when you load an area for the first time, and they will not update if your level changes or you reload the area. Of course, I can never level up to take advantage of this mechanic, but this challenge should be pretty easy if all the enemies are going to be scaled to level 1. The problem is... I lied. Enemies don't scale based on your level. They scale based on what level you should be. The game doesn't actually care whether or not I level up. It just checks how much experience I have, calculates what level that equals, and scales the enemies based on that. Which means... I need to avoid gaining experience at all costs. So my goal is not to escape Paragus. But to escape Paragus while killing as few enemies as possible. Great. These are the easiest enemies in the whole run, and I have to run away from them. Now, throughout the entire tutorial, there isn't a single enemy that I need to kill. But the more enemies I don't kill, the more enemies there are to shoot me as I run past them. I probably killed a lot more than I needed to, but that's alright. I got to the Ebon Hawk, and I'm on my way to Telos. Well, now that we just killed a planet, maybe one of you can tell me what's going on. There's a lot to do on Telos. Paragus was more or less the tutorial, and the devs aren't going to hold our hand much longer. All right, Jedi. I want you to cooperate. Telos has three main areas. Citadel Station, the planet surface, and a secret Jedi Academy, which is where we want to be. But in typical linear fashion, we start on Citadel Station. To get to the Academy, we need a ship. I don't remember why we can't use ours, but them is the rules. Two different organizations are willing to give us access to a ship. And because this is a Star Wars game, one of them is evil. I knew you'd come. It's time to choose our alignment. We don't have to marry ourselves to the light or dark side at this point, but being neutral is for losers who don't like free stuff. For so many reasons, it's better to choose the dark side. When you piss off good guys, they usually just let you walk all over them. You might feel like shit about it, but it's not going to hurt you. When you piss off bad guys, they usually want to kick your teeth in. So when in doubt, I'm going to be siding with the bad guys. I might be a piece of shit. Yes, of course. I will provide a shuttle. But I'm a piece of shit with access to a ship. We've made it to the surface of Telos, but our ship crash landed, so we need to steal a new one. None of the mercenaries here need to be killed, so we're going to sneak past them. But we run into an interesting obstacle. Entering this area triggers a cutscene where we confront the mercenary leader. There's no reason for this cutscene to exist. Every option results in a fight. And again, we don't have to kill this guy. But the cutscene deactivates our stealth, leaving us in a pretty compromised position. Make no mistake. I cannot win this fight. I could try to run through it, but that's going to take a lot of attempts. So, wedged between a rock and a hard place, I decided it was about time I started using glitches. Allow me to tell you about quick saving and quick loading. By using quick save and quick load, you can save and load the game without opening the menu. Opening the menu is really inconvenient because it pauses the game, meaning when you load the game back, you're going to be in the same predicament you were two seconds ago when you saved the game. But by quick saving, 
you can save the game while the game is still running. For a short period of time after quick saving, no new triggers can be activated. This means dialogue can't be started, cutscenes can't be triggered, and AIs can't be activated. And at the same time, during this short period, you can move. So, if you quick save over and over again, you can move around without triggering cutscenes and dialogue. The only problem is, once that short period is over, and you stop quick saving, all of the triggers that were supposed to be activated start activating. But not to worry. All you have to do is tell the game that you'd rather not. Not all triggers in the game work the same, but for the most part, if you just load your latest quick save, the game forgets all about those triggers and you can move on with your life. In this instance, I can't stop the enemy AIs from activating because I need to use this console. And once I use the console, that's the end of the glitch. But if we can make it into the next area, we'll be safe. I mentioned earlier that we only lose if all of our party members go down at the same time. Well, unfortunately, if any of our party members are down, we can't travel to new areas. And party members can only revive after combat is over. Except, that's a lie. Death is a complete joke in this game. If you try to travel to a new area but some of your party members are down, the game will inform you that you cannot travel to a new area if any of your party members are down, and then proceed to revive all of your party members for you. I'm not joking, this is a legitimate game mechanic. So all I have to do is try to walk through the loading zone, the game will revive all of my downed party members, and then walk through the loading zone again. Of course, party members revive with basically no health, so if they go down again in the time it takes me to walk through the loading zone again, it'll just revive them again. And provided one of my party members is still alive to run through the door, I can repeat this process indefinitely until the door lets me through without the need to kill any enemies. Now that we're inside the base, we've got to find a ship and steal it. Before we can steal the ship, we need to sabotage the power generator, which allows us to override the hangar door controls. And logically, you'd think with the doors open and the ship ready to go, we could just leave. Nope. Opening the hangar doors activates a tank droid, which if we don't kill, the dialogue option to enter the ship will never trigger. And this thing will fuck you up. There's no way all three of my party members could have any hope of beating this thing. It takes like 20 seconds for one of us to even hit it. This is where I learned about another fun game mechanic. If you activate a console, all of your downed party members will be magically revived. I have no idea why this works. As you can imagine, this took a while. Now, with the droid defeated, we can finally steal this shuttle and travel to the secret Jedi Academy. Nothing of interest actually happens at the Academy. We have the Ebon Hawk back and are free to continue on our quest. As mentioned earlier, this is where the game's branching paths open up. We are supposed to travel to four different planets and find the Jedi Masters hiding there. But I don't actually want to do that yet. Now that I have access to the majority of the galaxy, I want to gather all the gear together that I will need to beat this game. Up to this point, I've been flying by the seat of my pants. It was pure luck that made it possible to beat all of the enemies up to this point. When it comes to some of the really powerful Sith Lords, the revive my party members 6,000 times strategy isn't going to cut the cheddar. Not only will that take hours, it probably isn't possible. So we need a way to deal damage. And you probably already know what I have in mind. I made a pretty big deal about demolitions earlier. That's because I need bombs. Lots of bombs. Coder 2 is based on the D20 system. Every attack must roll a 20-sided die to determine whether or not it hits. Now there's a whole calculation involving strength and dexterity, but at the end of the day, it boils down to enemy stats good, our stats bad. However, no matter how bad your stats are, and no matter how strong your opponent is, a roll of 20 will always be a hit, and a roll of 1 will always be a miss. Which gives us at least a 1 in 20 chance to hit, 
and our opponents at least a 1 in 20 chance to miss. There are a few exceptions to this rule, though, and one of them is explosives. Grenades and mines have a 100% chance to hit, but if your opponent makes a saving throw, they will only take half of the damage. Given how strong all of the enemies are, this basically means that all of our explosives deal 50% damage, but that's a hell of a lot more than 100% of zero. This means we can defeat any opponent, provided we can gather enough explosives. And, that is why you will die. and to that end, we have access to a seemingly infinite supply of explosives. There's a reason I chose to do this challenge in Coder 2 instead of Coder 1, and that is the crafting system. Mines and grenades can be crafted at a lab station for the cost of chemicals, which is the resource used to craft items at a lab station. Items may also be broken down into chemicals at a lab station, provided that item is a chemical-based item. There are also component-based items that can be crafted and broken down at workbenches. In general, consumable items like med packs and stimulants are chemical-based and equipable items like lightsabers and blasters are component-based. All we need is an infinite source of consumables, and we have ourselves a way to make infinite mines and grenades. As it happens, I already knew this was the case. Several shops throughout this game sell infinite supplies of medpacks, which, when bought with credits, can be then broken down into infinite chemicals and crafted into infinite explosives. So all we need now is infinite money. And wouldn't you know it, I already knew this was possible as well. I don't want to bore you, like I bored myself while performing this very intentional, legitimate game mechanic, so I'll be quick. <sighs> Travel to Dantooine, progress through the main quest until you need to protect the village from mercenaries. Travel to the back of the building and examine some of the defense droids. You'll find the Hydro Spanner of the man who will be shaking down. Confront the merchant just outside of the building, who has been stealing parts off of these droids as is proven by him admitting to it. Tell him you're not going to tell anyone about this sensitive information and he'll agree to give you a discount. Travel back to Telos. Bring two friends, one who is skilled in the art of repair, and one in stealth. Head to the area with two warring merchants and talk to the first merchant. Purchase as many repair parts as you can. Have your mechanic friend borrow their workbench, breaking down all of your repair parts into components. Then have your sneaky friend process all of the components into mild Deveronian edges. If you're efficient about it, this can be the same friend. Return to the merchant on Dantween, who we are extorting, and sell him all of the edges you have just crafted. Travel back to Telos and repeat the process. <sighs> At some point, you may want to start reinvesting your profits in explosives if for no other reason than to break up the incessant clacking of your keyboard with the sound of... Oh wait, no, that's just more keyboard abuse. But you will need to turn your credits into mines at some point, and it might as well be now. Of course, you'll need to make a bit of a detour before you can start crafting mines. You probably remember when I mentioned just how important the demolition skill was, which includes demolitions. More on that later. Let's explain why. At most, you can have 15 mines placed on the ground at any given time. The strongest mine in the game, the Devastating Plasma Mine, deals 96 damage, or 48 damage if the saving throw is made. So with one stack of mines, you can deal between 720 and 1440 damage. One of the weaker mines in the game, the Miner Frag Mine, deals 18 damage, or 9 damage if the saving throw is made. With this stack of mines, you will deal between 135 and 270 damage. According to the strategy wiki, the final boss has 1,180 health. This is calculated assuming that she is level 31. At this level, it would take anywhere from 66 to 132 minor frag mines to kill her. Given her level, she would likely make every single saving throw, requiring all 132 mines to get the job done. And of course, these would need to be set up in groups of 15, detonated, and set up again, 9 times. Each time giving her the opportunity to catch you with a force power like force lightning, which might kill you, or Insanity, which will allow her to catch you and kill you. What I'm saying is, it's possible, but it isn't likely ever going to happen. Now, to contrast this strategy with Devastating Plasma Mines, it could take as little as 13 one time, with little chance of failure. But, as always, there are a few problems. One. Devastating Plasma Mines require 29 demolitions. 2. I can't get 29 demolitions. And 3. I have no idea what level Kreia is actually going to be. So what is possible? Well, as discussed before, I can at most get 4 demolitions at the start of the game. 
I can also get a plus four intelligence modifier, which gives me plus four demolitions. And there are a number of items throughout the game that give bonuses to demolitions. At best, these items can give plus 19 demolitions. That would give me 27, which is more than enough to make deadly plasma mines. All of the items I need are sold exclusively in shops. But not all shops can sell these items, and none of the shops that can sell these items are guaranteed to sell them. A shop's inventory is randomly generated the first time you browse it, and will never change. I can't stress how much I hate this mechanic. There are only a handful of merchants that can sell even some of these items, and often, if they can sell one of these items, they can sell a few others as well. This is bad. Let's take Undar as an example. Undar can sell the Exchange Utility Belt, the Tech Specialist Belt, the Skills System, the Skills D Package, and the Bothan Precision Gloves. If I check Undar's inventory, he might sell one of these items. I could buy that one item, but then his inventory would be set, and he can never sell me any of the other items. So by saving before talking to him, I can reroll his inventory as many times as I like, but I can only choose one of those inventories. I must have rerolled his inventory 200 times, and in all of those times, the most I ever saw was two in the same inventory. One item that he is supposed to be able to sell, I never even saw. To put it mildly, the odds ain't great. So if Undar gives me the exchange utility belt, do I take it? Or do I wait until he sells the tech specialist belt? If I take the Botham Precision Gloves, will I be able to get the exchange utility belt from somewhere else? Probably. But what if the only merchant that can give it to me is also the only merchant who can give me the skills system? Is it even possible for them to sell both in the same inventory? Remember, nobody had ever done this before. I didn't have me here walking me through each step of the process. It was a strategy of, get the best you can, and hope it's enough. I didn't know how strong the enemies would be, how many I would be able to skip, what level of mines I could make, how many of those mines I would need, or if I could even make this all work. All I knew was, I was going to make it work. In order to do this, we have to rewind the clock a little bit. I gave you the impression earlier that I immediately went to get infinite credits as soon as I got off Telos. That wasn't so much a lie as it was a simplification. I need money to get infinite mines, but I also need money to get infinite money. You see, the infinite money glitch requires breaking down parts. The more repair you have, the more components you get from these parts. One part costs 200 credits and breaks down into 10 components at 20 repair. Each component can be crafted into a mild Deveronian edge and sold for 24 credits, which is a profit of 40 credits for each part you buy. At 18 repair, this method is barely profitable, and with any less, you will actually lose money. And I'd just like to take a moment to really help you understand just how terrible of a moneymaker this method really is. Even at 20 repair, it's only 40 credits per part. It takes at least 24 inputs to fully process a single part. 3 to buy it, 1 to break it down, 10 to craft into edges, and 10 to sell them. Which works out to about 1.6 credits for every button I press. And at 18 repair, that's only 0.6 credits per button. Right. Back to what I was saying before. I need at least 18 repair to start making money. Beodur has the highest repair skill, starting at 13 so I still need a plus 5 bonus before I can start making any money. There are a few options I can choose from, but I think the most obvious choice would be to get the Tech Specialist Belt, because it gives a plus 5 bonus to repair, and it only costs 18,200 credits. Mm -hmm. Now in hindsight, this could have been a lot easier, but if I screw up anything at any point, I might inadvertently softlock myself out of enough damage to complete the run. That's not to say I would have to abandon the challenge, or even start over from the beginning. Hell no. I kept meticulous saves and backup saves and backup saves for my backup saves. The problem is, if I do screw up, I likely won't know until it's too late. The gameplay at this point in the run is hours upon hours of reloading shop inventories, and I don't really know if it's going to work until I've got all the items I need or I run out of shops. And beyond that, 
I might get stuck on a tough boss later on because I didn't spring for the fancy explosives right now. Regardless, I had to try something. So the strategy I settled on was this. Travel to each shop and reload their inventories until I have all the items to get 20 repair and 23 demolitions, which are the requirements for fast infinite money and deadly plasma mines. At this point, I don't actually have the money to buy these items. As you can imagine, it's tricky to earn credits when you've been running from every enemy in the game. Once the items are all locked in, I will buy just what I need to get 18 repair. The next step after getting 18 repair is to get 20 repair. What can I say? Capitalism's a bitch. And finally, I can make all the money I need to get 23 demolitions. Altogether, this is going to set me back 55,750 credits. Ouch. But it's not as bad as the next thing I need to buy. Based on some reasonable estimates I did, I decided that a reasonable amount of explosives to get me through to the end of the game would be 99 frag grenades, 50 ion grenades, 99 average frag mines, 50 deadly plasma mines, and roughly 1700 chemicals in reserve to become whatever I need them to be. Let's break down the cost. Frag grenades cost 80 credits each, so 99 grenades will cost us 7920 credits. The rest of the items we need are only sold in a limited supply and need to be crafted. Ion grenades cost 65 chemicals, and chemicals cost 2.66 credits each at 15 treat injury, which works out to 8,645 credits. Average frag mines cost 125 chemicals, which will cost 32,917 and a half credits. Deadly plasma mines cost 200 chemicals. That works out to 532 credits per mine, or 26,600 credits. And the 1,700 reserve chemicals will cost 4,522 credits for a total of 80,604 and a half credits. Now, if you add that to the 55,750 credits I already spent, and the 32,642 credits I have left over for my reserve reserve, that's an astonishing 168,996 and a half credits. I know y'all are doing the math along at home. That means I had to smash my keyboard an impressive 105,623 times. That's a lot of damage. Let's hope it's enough. I've been avoiding it up to this point, but I should really start to round up the Lost Jedi. There are four planets, four Jedi, and four long missions to rescue them. Dantooine is nearly complete, but the last task I need to finish is helping a band of mercenaries raid the local village. However, afterwards, I will lose access to Akir and his infinite credits. I'm going to finish this planet last, just in case I run out of money. The planet I'd like to do first is Onderon, because Onderon must be completed in two parts. After completing the first part, we need to wait for the game to trigger a cutscene that will activate the quest and allow us to finish the planet. Coder 2 is an old game, and it has a bit of a reputation for softlocking. I also read somewhere about a possible level check involved, which, if true, I'd like to know about sooner rather than later. To get to Onderon, well, this is Onderon we need to gain the approval of Mandalore. It's a pretty standard gain approval mission. There are seven mini-quests, and I need to complete four of them. This would normally involve going out into the jungle and killing everything you see. After some internal debate, that's pretty much what I did. I tried to avoid as many areas of the jungle as I could, but ultimately, there was only so much I could do. I managed to gain access to Onderon, and it didn't cost me a single mine. I'd call that a success. Onderon is more straightforward. Clear a wrongly convicted man of murder charges. He's a doctor by the name of Dagon Ghent. So he can set up a meeting with Master Kavar. I really wish there was an evil way to complete this mission, because at some point I piss off a very large group of people who all want to murder me. They've ambushed me in the worst possible way, with a cutscene after a loading zone. This one took me a great deal of time to solve. First of all, there's no way I can beat them. And the enemies are crowding the entrance. So I can't really use it to revive my party. If I do, my entire party will be swiftly shot down. I can give my party members commands, and even control them. But I can only control one character at a time. If I have one party member trying to revive the others, I don't have any attention left to do anything useful with the other party members. It's not possible to issue move commands, so the reviving must be done manually. At some point, my medic will be killed, 
and everyone else will be down to their last life. Hopefully, by this point, one of my other party members will have made it far enough away to survive. Handmaiden is my best hope here. With enough tries, I was able to hide her around the corner and escape combat. After that, she can cloak her way to the cantina entrance and I can start the whole infinite revives process. I shall remain hidden. But this time, I just couldn't keep my party alive long enough. When you enter a loading zone, but you can't go through, the game moves you backwards to avoid getting you stuck in an infinite loop of re-triggering the loading zone. Ready. And the game pushes you back a little farther than it needs to, just to be safe. For QA purposes, this was pretty smart. But for my purposes, it means it takes about a second to re-trigger the loading zone, which is more than enough time for 20 gang members to re-murder one of my party members. There are a few different techniques that I've found to get out of these situations, but none of them are applicable here. So I just kept trying until it worked. After a brief confrontation in the cantina, Get them, men! I must return to the palace. Run! What have you done to my men? Men, take care of him! It's time to leave. All those guys are still here, but I can stealth past them this time. The soldiers that I'm supposed to be fighting right now have decided to join forces with the gangs. I guess the game really expected me to kill them. Oh well. Time to GTFO the fuck out of here. I don't need compliments from a murderer. The next planet on my list is Narshada. This is the planet I was most afraid of. Narshada is notorious for softlocks. Whether all the stories from people complaining on forums were true softlocks, I don't know. But I've definitely spent my fair share of hours here stumped on how to trigger the next part of the quest. The Offender always seems to be the first quest. It's another gain approval rating quest, but this time the game never explicitly tells you it's an approval rating quest. It's honestly just a really stupid move by the developers. Your goal is to complete a bunch of quests until you gain the exchange's attention. I managed to scrape together enough approval without ever having to kill anyone, but it did involve doing some nice things for some nice people. Yuck. That was noble of you. The next part of the quest is where things start to get scary. We just got this message on the convoy. Looks like trouble. Anytime I'm forced to take specific party members or play as a single party member is extremely difficult. Best case scenario, I can choose the party members I take, but I can't change them. Next best case would be I can't choose which party members but I still have three. Then would be, I can choose one party member, and that's all I get. And worst case, I get one party member who is predetermined by the game. Well, good thing it's not a trap. On Narshada, we'll have to deal with each of these scenarios, many of them more than once, and all of them more or less in rapid succession. First, Atten is all alone at the bar when he is approached by the twin sons. Wamba, wamba, si son, ne son, tem, waka, waka. I don't stand a chance, and there isn't enough time to place mines. I guess it's a good thing I knew this fight was going to happen. Before finishing the last quest, I stop by the bar to make a few preparations. I have to imagine that the other patrons in the bar are a bit rattled. Jesus, those mines were there the whole time? Well, that's it. The bounty hunter truce is off. After some pointless plot development, we need to meet some quarrying in the Jek Jek Tar. Now, the Jek Jek Tar is kind of like the center for aliens that don't breathe good and want to learn how to do other things good, too. It's a bar filled with poisonous gas. We were supposed to have an environment suit for this part, but someone thought they needed it more than we did. Let me just take that environment suit. So the game teaches us the breath control force power. We started the game with zero force points, and this power costs 20. Let's see. 20 minus zero is... Carry the four... Darn, we're 20 short. Actually, we have 16 force points now, but that's still not... Hold on. 20 minus 16, okay, 4... Nope, never mind. Ne never mind. It was an unrelated thought, turned out to be nothing. Let's just move on, okay? So I was prepared for this. As it turns out, you can just put on a gas mask. I... I don't know why this force power is in the game. Like, it makes for good drama... But why the fuck would anyone in their right mind run into a room full of poisonous gas with no respirator and absolutely no knowledge that this force power exists? It's stupid. It's just stupid. This is by far the stupidest, most railroady, and worst designed parts of this game. Let me just step back a little and explain how stupid it is. We went to the Jek Jek Tar alone, but surprise! 
Myra decided to beat us up, steal our environment suit, and go in our stead. Why? Because she knew it would be a trap. So when we wake up, we decide we still have to go there, and we're not going to go get another suit or any of our friends. Myra springs the trap and gets brought back to some secret lair. We try to break into this secret lair, but uh-oh, turns out it's impossible to break in. If only someone were already inside who could open the door. Myra wakes up, has to fight Hanhar in some arena deathmatch, and open the door to let us in. Finally, we confront the evil mastermind in his secret lair. But what's this? He set another trap for us. What are we going to do? And then, the evil mastermind's even smarter, eviler boss decides now is the perfect opportunity to spring his trap and capture me. Now be honest, did any of that sound necessary to you? Because it didn't to me. You might have noticed that some of the stuff I just said hasn't happened yet. That's because I'm the one who has to play as Myra, kill Hanhar, and escape the base. Even though this whole time, none of this fucking matters because I'm just going to get caught by yet another trap that I blindly hurl myself into. And really, if you played this game before, you had to go through the exact same bullshit. So we're just going to skip right over it. I'm a prisoner on board Goto's yacht now, and I need to choose two party members to rescue me. I don't know how experience works when I'm not present, but I have to imagine that I don't get any of the experience unless I'm in the party. I probably should have checked. This part is pretty similar to the Myra section, but with the added benefit of my party not being useless. Well, they're not entirely useless. I don't know if I've really mentioned it yet, but no leveling means no leveling my party members either. Luckily, most party members don't start at level 1 like I do, so they're quite a bit more competent. And I don't really have a great way of checking, but I have to imagine the enemy's level in this area will be based off the highest level member of my party, which would usually be me, because I'm almost always present to receive the experience. So these enemies should be a little easier than I'm used to. But, as usual, I'm going to do my best to not fight any of them. This whole ship is really more of a puzzle than anything. I have a few main objectives to complete. Rescue myself, acquire self-destruct codes, enter self-destruct codes into the correct terminal, and escape the ship. Ideally, I want to rescue myself as late as possible. Again, I didn't confirm this, but I'm pretty sure any experience I receive now won't get added to my character. An important tactic for sections like this is to always unequip all items from your character before you move on to the next section. If one party member is wearing something, nobody else is able to wear that same item. But if they take it off, the item goes into group storage, and even if, canonically, your character shouldn't have access to group storage, the game usually gives you access to group storage anyways. So that means, if Atten, Myra, Bao Dur, or Handmaiden are ever in trouble, they can usually stealth or demolitions their way out of it. You just have to strategically know when to remove all of your gear. So you're the big Jedi that everyone's been talking about. Once I'm free of Goto's yacht, I'm confronted by the Jedi Master who I was looking for the whole time. I don't even know why I bother writing this script. Apparently you can break all the cardinal rules of good storytelling, just end with, and they lived happily ever after, and you've got yourself one of the most critically acclaimed RPGs of all time. Now I can't be too upset, because I knew Master Zez Kyle was going to confront me here, and I knew he needed to die. Well, actually, he didn't need to die. I've already got everything I needed from choosing the dark side. But as you may have noticed, I already filled this room with a metric fuckton of mines. Whoops. On the bright side, I got a cool 25 force points out of the deal. I can cast breath control now. Seriously, why is this force power in the game? Now that I've found one of the lost Jedi, I can start the second phase of Onderon's main quest, which is another clusterfuck of, we sure hope you remember to gear up your other party members. The name of the game here is Stealth. One team will need to travel to Duxon and storm an ancient Sith temple, while the other team will follow me to Onderon's capital and rescue the Queen. The Sith temple is the first up. It seems I can sneak into the temple without incident. Once inside, I need to travel down the middle path to reach some Sith apprentices performing a ritual. The door is locked, but it takes a quick detour down the left side path to unlock it.
Every enemy up until now has been optional. But now I have to confront the Sith performing their ritual. I can quick save, quick load to stop their AI from activating, but they still need to die. Captain, we fail you. As you command. The game conveniently erects an invisible wall between me and all the enemies I just skipped. Break the ritual now. Conveniently, if I try to escape, the game teleports my entire party to me. I'm not stuck here with you. You're stuck here with us. We're outmatched, so this is a good time to use up some explosives. When we're done, Zarga approaches to congratulate us on our tremendous accomplishment. What you have done is beyond words. To be honest, I'm more impressed by him. He managed to get here through all of those enemies who aren't even remotely dead. But let's not dwell on that too much, because we've got a queen to save. We are thrust into the middle of the town square, and it's crawling with guards who want to murder us. This is a rare situation. We've just entered a new area, and there's no door to run back through. Which means, we need to run. Now. They haven't come up before, but the only way we're going to survive this encounter is with shields. How do I explain shields? Shields are an incredibly broken item that allow you to bypass some of the more tedious aspects of this game. Like, say, taking damage. When you activate a shield, it will absorb damage until that damage reaches the limit of the shield, and then deactivate. Different shields are rated for different amounts of damage and different damage types. And pretty much every shield I've ever checked can be used five times before being destroyed forever. But what's much more important to understand than shields being consumable items, is shields are everywhere. Killed the guy? Here's a shield. Won the swoop race? Have a shield. Opened a wicker basket? Here's ten shields. Where was I going with this? I don't know. Have a shield. Shields are also one of the exceptions to the you can't equip items during combat rules. So if you're ever in a pinch, use a shield. They're really good. The only time a shield might not be the answer is if you're facing a lot of different damage types. But as a general rule, put on an energy shield and you'll be fine. In the next area, we've got a number of force fields blocking our path. To get through them, we're going to stab them with a lightsaber. This next section has an obnoxious number of cutscenes as well, which is really bad for stealth, but luckily is pretty useful for reviving you as you tank with your face. I don't think I've actually mentioned it, but there's a civil war or coup going on right now. The kingdom's general is trying to... Anyways, we're on the queen's side because I didn't know I had a choice. A fun mechanic of coder is regardless of how an enemy dies, you always get the experience for it. Blow up some Sith troops by overloading a power coupling? 300 experience. Cut them down with a lightsaber? 300 experience. Hack the turret system to target allies instead of enemies? 300 experience. Watch them get eaten by hungry Canoks? Watching the Canoks gorge themselves on the bloodied corpses of your enemies, you can't help but feel you've discovered a profound wisdom. Here's 300 experience. But my personal favorite, leave the guard captain to be minced by an angry squad of vibrosword wielding revolutionaries? Have 10,000 experience, you monster. With minimal effort, I manage to squeeze through the remaining enemies and enter the palace. The palace has three paths, left, right, and straight. The straight path is locked until I override the door. To do that, I need to grab the override codes at the end of the right path and bring them to the terminal at the end of the left path. The hardest part of all of this is getting through this door. I can attempt to bash it down, but bashing doors in this game feels too much like fighting enemies. No, really. That's how the game treats bashing doors down. The door is an enemy, and it's only going to open if you beat the shit out of it. As I think I've made this point painfully clear, my stats are abysmal. To the point where, this door is actually a formidable opponent. But there are other ways to open locked doors. Nobody in my party has the skills to pick the lock but I do have a sizable stash of explosives. Inside the room, you're supposed to kill everyone, rescue the man being tortured, stop the hacker, and steal the override codes. But as it turns out, we can do all of that, minus the killing, without harming a soul. Just sneak in, talk to the hacker, and tell him you'd like him to leave. Use his computer to free the man inside the force cage, then talk to the man inside the cage during his interrogation. 
He'll explain that you need to use the hacker's computer. Swipe the codes from the computer. And finally, tell the prisoner that you'd like to get out of here. Then, through what I can only imagine was a daring and bold sacrifice on his part, we find ourselves at the entrance of the palace again, far from those hurtful blasters and that room full of angry soldiers. The left path is much less dangerous. We can more or less just run through to the end. So you're the Jedi, eh? With the main path open, it's time for the final showdown. Watch out! I've lost control of the beast! The path to the throne room is blocked until this beast is killed, so I end up using a few mines to take it down. And finally, to wrap things up, we've just got to kill General Vaklu. Good thing I brought all of these grenades. Now, normally this would be the part where I confront Master Kavar and kill him for what he did to me. But that's not an option if you save the Queen. Which works out great for me later, but enough foreshadowing. I've got more Jedi to find. The third planet we will be completing is Korriban. You might already know that Korriban is an absolute joke of a planet. Not lore-wise, mind you, just in this game. The entire main questline on this planet consists of entering the Sith Academy, finding the Jedi Master you came here for is dead, getting ambushed by Darth Sion, come here for answers? and running away. Nothing that interesting really happened. Let's just move on. It is at this point in the run that I need to come clean about something. All the footage I've showed you up to this point has been fake. I started this challenge almost a year ago now, and I didn't record any of it. Because I've never really done stupid shit like this so other people could watch it. I've always done stupid shit like this because doing stupid shit like this is what I like to do. But this point in the run was sort of the point of no return. After I finish the quest on Dantooine, my gear is locked in, and I'll have to finish the game with whatever supplies I have left. My nerves got to me. I put the game down, and didn't pick it back up until a couple of weeks ago. That all being said, all of the footage you see from now on is actually from the run. All of that footage you just saw was the result of me going back through my memories, step by step, and trying my best to faithfully recreate what actually happened. I still had a lot of my old backup saves that I used throughout the run to help me piece things together, and I would say that I was more or less able to recreate everything 80 to 90% accurately. The main reason I'm telling you this is to explain why, in the rest of these clips, I seem to forget everything I've just spent the last 45 minutes explaining to you, but most importantly, how I, through sheer incompetence, stumbled upon the most broken glitch in the game, that simultaneously may have saved the entire challenge. And as I said, it all started just a few weeks ago. I had just finished my third video on beating Dark Souls without using any of the items from other Dark Souls, and I was ready to start my next project. Eventually, I settled on this video that you're watching right now. I loaded up my last save file to try and remember where I had left things. I was on Dantooine, which, looking back, was a clear sign to myself in the future to fucking finish Dantooine. But I had a fond memory of already finishing Dantooine. Which I wasn't wrong about. During the routing and testing of this run that I had done almost a year prior, I finished Dantooine several times in order to confirm it was possible, and to continue to test and route the rest of the game after Dantooine to see if it might be possible. Nevertheless, I figured Dantooine was already complete which meant that I need to figure out how to progress to the next section of the game. After finding all four Jedi, you're supposed to go confront them at the Jedi Academy on Dantooine. But when I got there, the Academy was thoroughly locked. Hmm. Did I miss some small cutscene that tells me to go to the Jedi Academy? According to the wiki, Kray is supposed to tell you to travel to the Academy after you find all four Jedi. But I don't remember if she's done that yet. Maybe I missed one of the Jedi. My journal pretty clearly shows that I've completed Onderon. Not only that, but I can never return to Onderon once the quest is complete. And I have a previous save file from Goto's yacht, which, if I managed to get off his yacht, I would have had to have confronted the Jedi Master on Nar Shadda. And I've got another journal entry saying that I've found the body of Lona Vash on Korriban. 
Narshida, Onderon, and Korriban are all complete. So that must mean that I have to go back to Korriban and complete the Trials of the Sith Tomb. You're right. I should have realized that I was missing Dantooine. But I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't. When you first arrive on Korriban, Kray mentions this Sith cave and says you should return here later. There is great power and dark energy within this cave. I would advise you to finish your explorations within the academy before venturing into the cave. I, of course, took this to mean that maybe you have to return here later. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. When I approach the tomb, this happens. As I told you before, you do not have the strength to enter this place yet. You gotta be shitting me. Is this the one point in the game that is actually going to perform a level check? A real level check? You know, like the ones that actually check if I'm the right level? The answer is yes. This appears to be the one area of the game that actually does a real level check. But instead of accepting defeat, instead of realizing that this entire challenge is impossible to complete, I walked right into that tomb to give those dead Sith Lords a piece of my mind. Wait, what? No, you heard me right. The game isn't supposed to let me into the tomb until I'm at least level 10. But it didn't stop me. The game was supposed to do something else here too, but we'll get to that later. I enter the tomb with Atten and Visus. We walk into the tomb together to face the many trials it has in store for us. The majority of these trials involve being confronted by ghosts of your past. I want you to admit to them why you did the things you did. But they're just ghosts, so we can carry on our merry way. Now these ghosts are pretty wily. They actually managed to lay some mines. Don't mind if I do. And then I get confronted by the ghosts of my party members, and they all yell at each other about how Kray is evil and we've got to kill her. You're threatening Atten with a lightsaber, and I'm supposed to just stay out of it? No. And then I think I said the wrong thing. Because they all started chanting, Apathy is death. Apathy is death. Apathy is death. Apathy is death. And then they just disappeared. Finally, in the next room, is Darth Revan, Dark Lord of the Sith. Don't worry, guys. He's not the real Revan. It's just another ghost, see? Ruh oh, Raggy? It's a. S -s 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 Sith Ghost! I wasn't really in the mood for fighting Revan, so I elected to lay a few mines down. Everyone knows a Sith Ghost's greatest weakness is a couple of well placed mines. You know what, Scoob? I think now would be a pretty good time to make like a hockey player and get the puck out of here. Rah! <laughs> Revan was the final trial of the tomb, and I guess he didn't actually need to die for the trial to be complete. Which is good, because I think I'm up a whole mind from that little endeavor. Running back to the ship, I was disappointed to find out that Kreia still didn't think it was time to go to the Jedi Academy. So traveling back to Dantooine, I thought I might as well check for myself. But, hang on, isn't that the merchant who I made hundreds of thousands of credits off of? And come to think of it, the whole town looks suspiciously unransacked by mercenaries. That can't be right. I'd definitely let the village be overrun by bandits. I guess I'm going to have to rectify the situation. After I dealt with that unfortunate accident, Kray was happy to inform me that the Jedi Masters would see me now. Realizing that my foray into the Sith Tomb was probably a complete waste of time, I wanted to reload an earlier save, and save me all the pesky experience that I had collected in there. But I thought better of it. It wasn't that much experience, and I did pick up a cute little mind friend along the way. As for the game's request, I must confront the Jedi Masters alone. Um, right. Three of them are dead. I will confront Master Kavar alone. He doesn't seem to want to settle for anything less than murdering me in cold blood. It seems a tad harsh, but alright, Kavar. If it's a fair fight you want, then it's a fair fight you'll get. Oh, shit, 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 shit! He's gonna kill me! I should have prepared for this! Kraya, help! Save me! What? What's going on? 
This isn't supposed to happen until after I defeat Kvar. But, hey, this works for me. And, yep, Kvar is dead. Well, that worked out pretty well, didn't it? If you've been following along the roadmap I laid out for you at the start of this video, then you know it's about time we return to Telos to confront Atris and her handmaidens. Because I chose a male character, and have access to Handmaiden as a party member, I also get to enjoy a little bonus section where I have to play as Handmaiden. And god damn it, Handmaiden needs to get a better name than Handmaiden. That's not a fucking name. I feel so stupid calling her that. Now, I have to single-handedly defeat all the other Handmaidens and Atris. This hardly seems fair. I don't know exactly how this section is supposed to go normally, but from what I recall, I can choose to kill each of the five Handmaidens, or deal enough damage to knock them out. I thought there was a third option where, if I lose, the game will allow me to enter and fight in her place. But it seems that her sisters are happy to straight up murder her and give me a game over screen. Great. The first trick I found was simply reloading a save before the fight starts will prevent their AIs from attacking me right away. They're still active though, and if I get too close, they'll still try to murder me. This is exactly the kind of situation that I brought all these frag grenades for. Except, the game has decided to not give me access to my full arsenal. I still have some frags though, so let's use what we have. With all of my frags, I can just barely defeat all five handmaidens. And next, I have to fight Atris. This should be fine, because the game can't possibly expect me to defeat Atris, an ex-Jedi Master, with just a side character, right? So let's just let her kill us, and I'll run in to save the day. As you might have guessed, this is no longer the case. Let me be clear. This isn't supposed to happen like this. The Handmaiden being defeated is supposed to trigger the next cutscene. And I don't know why, but when Atreus kills me, I immediately get a game over screen. But the game does have another trigger that should let me progress. It's possible to defeat Atreus as the Handmaiden. The game will accept either of these two outcomes. I'm just not sure how I'm ever going to defeat her. In my many attempts, there were a few times where my death triggered the next cutscene. But me being the idiot that I am, didn't bother to make a safety save. Because as I said, I'm an idiot. Enough. And I really needed to make a save here because I want to use as few mines as is necessary. And figuring out how many that is requires a little guesswork. So as you might have guessed, I squandered my first few chances before realizing how hard it is to get to this point. It seems to make this glitch work, or actually to make this glitch not work, I just need the game to operate as intended. Is that too much to ask? But I think the key is, Atris does too much damage. And the game says to itself, nobody's going to believe anyone could survive that. Better make them do it over again, and this time, make it look real. So what I need is for Atris to almost kill me. Or maybe she needs to just barely kill me. I'm not sure which it is, but the way we get there is the same. Atris needs to bring me down to maybe one quarter of my health. And then poison me with plague. Then I need to run away whilst dodging any range attacks that will kill me instantly until the plague can slowly and safely bring me to the appropriate health total. Cool, now we can blow up Atris with mines. Kill me. End this. And with that out of the way, we can move our attention to the Ravager. The Ravager is attacking Telos, and we need to do something about it because... You look terrible. Because... Because the game says so, okay? Darth Nihilus is aboard and he needs to die. It is at this point in the run that you might start to notice the glitch I mentioned earlier. Go on, see if you can spot it. Alright, let's watch that back together. As you can see, Atten isn't taking any damage. And the question you're probably asking yourself is, why isn't Atten taking any damage? Allow me to read to you a section of dialogue that we were supposed to hear earlier. Kreia, I believe you are strong enough to explore the tomb ahead. You will have to face the challenges of this tomb alone. Are you ready? Well, the reason we didn't hear it is because Kreia didn't say it. She was supposed to, and then we were supposed to respond with, I will go in alone, which would prompt the game to remove our followers from the party and send us into the tomb alone. Ever since I left that tomb, and maybe even inside it, Atten and Visus have been completely invulnerable. I don't know how it happened, I don't know why it happened, but I'm invincible now, baby, let's go! And immediately, I'm confronted with a problem that can only be solved with invincibility. Or at least, I never had to try and solve it without invincibility, which is pretty much the same thing. 
The loading zone to the next area is hidden behind a door that won't open. To get the door open, I need to kill all of the Sith in this area. And fortunately for me, all of my allies that are supposed to be helping me with this fight are conveniently broken. It took a while, but it's hard to lose when you can't die. After that, I was able to safely board the Ravager without incident. In that last section of the game, I was forced to take Atten with me. While on board the Ravager, I have to take Visus and Mandalore with me. I'm not shitting you. I stumbled across this glitch and accidentally applied it to two of the characters I would be forced to use later on. The glitch is useless after this point, and I just... I... You can't make this stuff up. So on board the Ravager, where there are countless really scary enemies, I had planned to use Visus' stealth for this section. It would have been a long, painful process of sneaking around the ship, planting bombs in strategic locations, and reloading every time an enemy detects me. But as it is, she can waltz around the ship without much concern, which makes this a whole lot easier. Trust me, you'll see just how annoying stealth can be later. And with the bombs planted, we can fight Darth Nihilus. There's not much to this fight. He's got a lot of health, and I've got a lot of bombs. Now that I have an invulnerable ally, I would have liked to save a few of my mines. But it would seem I cannot possibly out-DPS his drain life attack. Or hit him, you know, at all. So mines it is. To save on mines, I elect to plant them all in a row so I don't have to waste any on overkill. It takes about 14 mines for each of his two health bars. And thankfully, I still have some left over. Vesis once again escorts us safely through the ship, and we're free to chase after Kreia, who has fled to... Malachor 5. Malachor 5. Malachor 5. If you're not aware of the significance of Malachor 5, that's okay. It's not really relevant. But Malachor 5 is our final destination. And as I alluded to earlier, we must face this challenge alone. Malachor 5 is divided into six distinct locations. Two are on the planet's surface, three are within Treus Academy, and the last is Treus Core. There is one little twist along the way, however. After traveling across the planet's surface and reaching Treus Academy, a series of cutscenes play that lead you to playing as a secret party member. Remote. Beodur's trusty longtime companion, and useless training droid. And as remote, we have to run through the exact same two areas where we just were and activate four mass shadow generators. The issue here is the first time you run through this area, it is filled with angry storm beasts that want to murder you. On a normal playthrough of the game, you would just kill them and move on with your life. And later on, when remote has to run through the section, they would all be dead. I don't know why this section of the game exists. If the enemies are all dead, why do I have to do this part? Of course, I'm not about to kill any of them, so Remote has the now Herculean task of navigating the same storm beasts that I barely got through. And as I'm saying it out loud, I am starting to realize that all of this could have been avoided. As I said, this whole section is initiated by a cutscene, and I know a way to skip those. Let's just see if that would have... That would have done it. Oh well, I guess I already put in the work. So, here's how to navigate the storm beasts as remote. Step 1. Run right through them. Step 2. Wait, what? Turns out, if you just go full tilt into a storm beast, he won't have time to start an attack, because spacing is a little finicky in this game. And he can't turn around fast enough to hit you on the way out either. So that's cool. And yeah, I got through it pretty much first try. So we finished the remote section, and we're ready to take on Treus Academy. I mentioned earlier how awful stealth sections can be? Well, we're here. I hope you enjoy saving and reloading. The mechanics of stealth are pretty simple. When you enter the detection radius of a nearby enemy, they get to make a perception check. If they succeed, they're going to come fuck you up. And if they attack you, it will break your stealth, and everyone who didn't see you can now definitely see you. 
but if they don't detect you, you are free to make all the circles and loops around them you could ever dream of. Alright, so I just checked the wiki, and that's not true. While in an enemy's detection radius, a perception check is made every 20 seconds. But in the moment, I feel invincible. Ow, shit, fuck. Alright, I'll stop fucking around. So the first location in here is pretty easy. A few attempts and we got this in the bag. Moving to the next location, though, things get a little trickier. A lot of the enemies here are a lot stronger, and as a result, are better at detecting me in stealth. Now I can save the game at any time. But when I reload the game, all the stealth checks are immediately re-rolled. So it's best to choose my saves carefully. Eventually, I make it to the final area, and there's a pretty serious problem. I can't maintain stealth when traveling to a new location. And this area starts with some jerk right in my face. From here, it's a mad dash to the finish line. I'm not sure if all these enemies are just dumb and aren't smart enough to have developed object permanence yet, or if the game deliberately doesn't let them follow me into the final room. Either way is fine with me, though. This is the penultimate room of Coder 2, or I will have to face off against Darth Sion in glorious combat. I think you already know how this is going to go down. This is it. Treyas Core. Everything I've done, up to this point, has been to reach this room. If there had been another way, an easier way, I don't know it. As you might have guessed, this fight isn't as easy as laying a bunch of mines and blowing up Kreia. Oh wait. Yeah it is. Okay. That's not exactly how it happened. Once Kreia has less than 10 health, she initiates dialogue, at the end of which her health bar refills, and she summons three enchanted purple lightsabers. I already spent the majority of my 15 maximum mines I can place at a time taking down Kreia, so it's time to improvise. During this phase, Kreia will no longer attack you or move around. This makes it quite difficult to blow her up with mines. And her lightsabers will still chase you down. With a bit of luck and a good enough energy shield, I'm able to ditch all three lightsabers behind various sight blockers. And now I have time to properly prepare for phase two. These lightsabers have almost as much health as Kreia does, but they don't know who they're dealing with. With little effort, I am able to systematically set up the rest of my mines and lure each lightsaber to its untimely end.
Once all three lightsabers are dead, the final dialogue plays. Even the developers aren't cruel enough to force you to watch me kick Kray to death for three hours. You are greater than any I have ever trained. By killing me here, you have rewarded me more than you can possibly know. And so, my challenge is complete. Can you beat Knights of the Old Republic 2, the Sith Lords, without leveling up? You bet your ass you can. Thanks for watching.